liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Um, the levels look better now. <laughs> well, very good. So this, is, this is take two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, because I don't know what I had done before, but uh, you couldn't hear me on my first. <laughs> All right. I mean, you could, but... You would have had to turn the volume way up. And then when Liberty Larry responded, you I'd would have... Blow your eardrums exactly. out. Exactly. <laughs> so, had to fix yeah. that first. Yeah. So um, I thought, uh, considering the the news, that we need to relitigate the O.J. Simpson case. Oh, is that right? <laughs> uh, I mean, don't you think? Yeah, I, this, I is, this is important stuff. Well, I, I'm sure he's just relieved that, that um, his wife's killer is finally gone <laughs> <laughs> according to some yeah <laughs> some yeah. others say that he was covering for somebody who knows ah who knows man i i tell you i remember when that trial was going on like i'm mm-hmm. sure as as i'm sure you do um yeah like that yeah. was that was a fiasco man mm-hmm. like I, I, I didn't pay much attention to it at the time honestly i didn't really care i, I mean uh, I, it was one of those deals like like it just sucked you in kind of like the johnny depp case um, year or so ago, yeah, like it was one of those. That I followed it, and and it was one of those things that just sucked you in. And the OJ was the same thing. Although I was, I guess maybe I was in high school when that went on. I was young, younger, younger than I am now, obviously. Um, but but yeah, it was one of those things that just sucked you in because it was just like such a fiasco. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking that's probably why my memory of it is is kind of vague. Like I remember it going on, but yeah, that was. If you were in high school, that was a time in my life where I was like really disconnected from like news that type and stuff. Of thing. Yeah, yeah. Like I didn't even watch TV. Well, like all I well, did was that's what I was music, fixing to know? say is I remember all the TVs doing different spoofs of it because yeah. I remember specifically Seinfeld had a good one where yeah. <laughs> the glove don't fit. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I don't think Seinfeld's Ooh. very funny. Did I love Seinfeld? Yeah, a lot of people do. I yeah. just. It's me, it's definitely one of those shows like there's no middle ground. Like you either enjoy it or you hate it. Like there's not a whole lot of people that are like take it or leave it. To me, there's one person that's funny that's sometimes there. And yeah. the rest of the time, it's three people screaming and whining. Yeah, yeah they do a lot of that. <laughs> it's a show about nothing. <laughs> so. That's okay. I'm okay with shows about nothing. Yeah. I, um, I, I like... Uh, What's the, uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. I think that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't (laughs) seen that one. one. Really? Yeah. Uh, See, you really should have brought that flash drive tonight. You could have gotten the fourth season of Archer and a whole bunch of seasons of It's Always Sunny. Yeah. Um, but. No, I've heard it's good, but it's like I say, I hadn't, I hadn't checked it out. Yeah. It's, uh, it's amazing what you can do with a bunch of people that are completely unlikable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing about Seinfeld. Like, you're not really supposed to identify with any of those characters. They're all horrible people. Yeah. yeah <laughs> like, oh, yeah. throughout this, the whole show. You'll like, probably like It's Always Sunny, then. Because yeah. the, it's like that, but with less whining. Yeah, well, hey, so, sounds good. And set in a bar, mostly. Oh, even better. Right. I like bars. I like, <laughs> well, I like bars way better than coffee shops. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Who doesn't? Exactly. Nobody I want to know. <laughs> there you go. Well, okay. So, with all seriousness, we're... Not addressing the OJ. <laughs> We're not going to relitigate OJ. <laughs> no, no. Ah. I um, we got man, we just got more um, economics. More economics. Oh, before I move on to that, I should have pulled the clip. I man, I meant to. I forgot. Um, well, m- maybe I pull it after the podcast, and if so, I insert it here. Okay. <laughs> but the just to kind of reinforce the idea where there was a little bit of pushback about whether um, the CIA controls ISIS-K at all and so forth that we talked about on the last podcast. Yeah. Um, the uh, retired, um, what was he, a general? I can't remember. Might might be colonel. But anyway, uh, Lawrence Wilkerson. Okay. Um, there's a, a really interesting clip of of him talking about exactly that. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So like I didn't something p- recent. Yeah, that like he did the, recently. Yeah, in the last week, like really? since our podcast. Okay. Um. So I just wanted to look up Lawrence Wilkerson, ISIS CIA or something like that on YouTube. I bet you can find it. Yeah. Uh, if I don't end up putting the clip, <laughs> in. if it doesn't get inserted here. Yeah. Um. 
So uh, just so that you know, I wasn't pulling that out of my ass. That didn't come from nowhere. <laughs> like there are yeah. people, there are serious people yeah. who are also saying this. So. Okay. I, I you consider say, you to be a pretty serious yeah, person was, myself. But. I was going to say, in case you didn't consider me a serious person. Yeah. Um, but yeah, economics is what we're going to spend the bulk of the time on again. It just seems important. and Well, there's so much bad economics going on. Yeah, um, because uh, of the Biden recovery. Oh, is that what we're calling it? <laughs> I, I don't know what we're calling uh, it's it It's Bidenomics. I've heard that one. Yeah. Um, Bidenomics. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of incredible what you can get people to believe if you say it enough, maybe, or maybe there's just such a, so little understanding of the science of economics out there. I'm not sure. Um, but the, the big piece of news is that on April 1st, um, the state of California enacted a $20 an hour minimum wage for fast food workers up from their, their state minimum wage, which is 16, I believe. Wow. Might be 15, but I think it's 16. Yeah. Um, and this applies to, uh, what they call them something like limited service restaurants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They had some kind um, of fancy termination for fast food. <laughs> yeah. It's like they can't say fast food in the bill. They got to have some kind of fancy language for it. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure it was limited service restaurants. You have to have more than 60 locations in California. Um, And there is a a carve-out for bakeries. The popular opinion on why there's a carve-out for bakeries is because uh, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, um, a good buddy of his from college, uh, owns Panera Bread. Ah. And so this... (laughs) Uh, excludes Panera Bread. So, so from it's the not wage because increase. they're racist against bakers. No, okay. no, probably not. Okay. I, I don't know if there's a racist component to bakeries or not. Uh, Although bagels was on there, they might not like Jews. Oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what it is. Uh, at any rate, or maybe um, they really do like Jews. Or, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. I, uh, yeah. I, I think everybody loses it's, here. It's, yeah, I was going to say it's a loser all the way around. Like, yeah. there's no winners in this one. But, you know, we'll explain. Yeah. Um, it also establishes, this I love, uh, it establishes a fast food council under the Department of Industrial Relations in California. Yeah. Um, so you have another new layer of bureaucracy uh, to cost the government just a little bit more. Absolutely. Um, now there's a, this is such an odd thing anyway. Um, so I was listening to the Jimmy Dore show. I have a friend, he may or may not still be listening to this podcast. He's, he's pretty far left and I think got frustrated with the podcast. some. (laughs) Yeah. It, at least through the time period that we were talking about foreign policy, I wouldn't be surprised if he was listening. Yeah. Um, if he heard me say that we were going to talk about economics, he might have turned it off. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, I, I remember <coughs> having a discussion with him and him telling me Jimmy Dore was right wing. <laughs> um, that seems like a. Uh, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about Jimmy Dore, but I know more than that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, look, man, everybody to the right of you is not right wing. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's like everybody to the right of Lenin must be right wing as far as you're concerned. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, I, I don't there's a lot of things where Jimmy Dore falls down in the right place. He's kind of an old school liberal. Yeah. Um, economics is not one of the things where he falls down in the right place. Now, it doesn't it's not really relevant at this point because he's on tour. And so he's got somebody else standing in for him in the show. I don't know the guy's name, no. but they did like a half hour. um bit on this $20 minimum wage and it was just and so singing full. its praises I would assume. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, trying to really, uh, argue against the other side, which I, I, they seem to think that they did a great job at. I think that they failed at. So, yeah. initially, so you're going to fill in the gaps. <laughs> yeah. Initially I was thinking that I was just going to go through the whole episode, Yeah, but that seemed <laughs> tedious. So, um, I only pulled a few clips, All right. but, uh, maybe we can address some of these concerned and some of these concerns. And there was like good statistics in there, but there was bad interpretations. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, let's, I guess let's just go ahead and start with the first clip, right. um, where 
they're talking about, uh, okay, m- maybe a little setup first in terms of statistics. Um, the average fast food worker in California, or the, maybe you would say the median fast food worker in California, um, is a 26-year-old woman of color. All right. <laughs> All right. So the average age is 26. Something like 80% of the fast food employees are people of color and more than half are women. So that would give you a median fast food worker as a 26-year-old woman of color. Okay. All right. So that's probably important information for this clip. So you at least get the frame in which he's talking about this. All right. But here we go. All right. The old economy is gone, right? This is where people work now. They work at retail. They work at these fast food restaurants. These are the people who would have worked in factories at one time. And you know what happened with those factories? They had massive strikes in order to get the kinds of wages and benefits that eventually they got. Eventually working in a factory became a middle class kind of a job. You could raise a family. You could send your kids to college. Those jobs are gone. There seems an obvious first response to this, which is why do you think those factory jobs aren't available anymore? <laughs> right. We may have priced ourselves out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, which is a common thing, by the way, like that, that can absolutely happen. Like we've watched it. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, go study a little history. (laughs) Yeah. And, and I don't dispute that these, these are the, these aren't like summer jobs anymore. Um, that they're right about that Yeah, because there are no summer jobs anymore, essentially that they, especially in places like California that have so many restrictions and requirements on employers. Yeah. You have pushed so many jobs out of the market that this is like the lowest common denominator is still drawing adults with educations even because they can't find anything else. Yeah, it's all that's out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I don't, that I don't the, dispute that. That the more professional jobs are drawing more for professional people. And so these kind of, of wage hikes that they think help the poor people actually put more poor people out of work. It's yeah. it's the least skilled, least capable people that end up losing out on this. Now they can't have the $16. All right. I guess the question comes down to this. Would you rather have a $16 an hour fast food job or no job? Yeah. Because with given the current situation, that's where you're going to end up because mm-hmm. And as somebody that is that has people that work for me, I'm an employer. Like I like I, that's what I do. Um, there's some people that just aren't worth <laughs> like ten dollars an hour or fifteen or whatever it is. Like there's just, but they are worth like six or seven. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are things that I can find for them to do for those amounts of money, but it it just it doesn't work. Like when their skills just aren't to where they need to be. It's because it's an entry level position, whether it's $16 an hour or at seven, yeah. it's still an entry level position. Even if the average person is 26 years old. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Like if that's where your skill set is at, or if you're new to the industry, it doesn't matter. Maybe you worked in finance or at a bank for 20 years and now you're looking for a job in retail. Well, you're starting at the bottom because like that other experience just doesn't play over yeah at least in a lot of cases that's not 100 percent, but in a lot of cases that's just the reality well and you know it could be that you lost a job and you're in between jobs all kinds of things we had a guy that worked for us for a while who had been um a district level buyer for a major retail chain yeah and came to work for us doing data entry yeah yeah for eight bucks an hour or because something like that. Because he needed the he needed the job. Yeah. And you know, and for I don't know how that worked out with him specifically, but so oftentimes, like I've hired people in for those entry level positions, mm-hmm. and a year or two later, they're running the building with me. 
yeah. because they because they they have that personality, but they had to start somewhere. Yeah, and that's kind of my point with this with the minimum wage. I mean, the, we weren't. It wasn't that long ago we were talking about exactly that, and you were saying that practically the only requirement is that they show up every day. Yeah, well, that the bar's getting lower and lower. <laughs> Let's just yeah. let that be known. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like regardless, the minimum wage is an entry level wage, and the idea the idea isn't to stay at the entry level wage the whole time you're employed for your life. Like that's, if, if that's where your goal is, then you've got goal problems. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I'm not saying your work has to be your life, but you've got it. You get out of it what you put in. Well, speaking of minimum wage, we are one of very few states that still maintains the federal minimum wage, which is seven twenty five an hour. Yes, it is. And I challenge anybody listening to go <clears throat> find a job paying that here. Oh Yeah. Like it don't it doesn't exist. What's your what's your minimum starting? Where I, where I work, we start people all at ten, and I'm telling you right here, right now, like that's low. Like yeah. you can't. We, we struggle to find people at that pay rate, and it's dollars over the minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, like you, I I truly don't believe you can find a job paying the actual minimum wage. Yeah, probably not. Well, one of the reasons that you might blame for that. Um, is that uh, the minimum wage has not risen with um, cost of living increases, inflation, essentially. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the minimum wage hasn't gone up since 2009. The, the estimates that I saw of what the minimum wage should be based on the value of the dollar, yeah, <laughs> which is terrifying, um, yeah. is that the minimum wage should be close to $23 an hour. I mean, I if, be- it, if it had risen with the with the loss of value of the dollar, yeah, I want to make it real clear that that's, that's not that's what's happening yeah. here. Yeah, um, that so. Uh, so if you think about that, like this is where your problem is. That your problem starts with the Federal Reserve and the money supply devaluing um, your money. Yeah, yeah, that your dollar has lost two thirds of its value over the last forty years or whatever. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. I, I want to say that the starting point of the statistics I was looking at was like the 1980 or something like that. Okay. That's why I say 40 years. It yeah. might actually have started with 2009, but yeah. I don't think that that's, that was the baseline minimum wage that they used to show what it should be if it had risen with inflation. Yeah. But I can't remember, and I can't pull up the chart right now. So yeah, sorry, everybody. Well, and my point kind of is, is it, it almost doesn't matter what the minimum wage is. Like, the market should determine these things. And that's what kind of my point I was making is here locally it has. Because, like I said, you can't find the job paying the minimum wage. Yeah. Um, well, another funny thing that they were saying on the podcast, on the Jimmy Dore show, yeah. um, was that uh, – that it doesn't matter what the minimum wage is anyway. Yeah. Um, that uh, these you know these companies are already charging way more than they need to for the for the food that they're selling and so on. And that um, <laughs> so not it, only do we want to make them pay the workers more, we want them to charge less for the product. Well, of course, but uh, <laughs> like, man, we're, we're saying, just we're going to bankrupt these companies one way or the other. <laughs> they were saying that, you know it's the same everywhere. A Big Mac and fries is eighteen dollars. And so I was like, well, let me, because we don't it's have not. a $16 minimum wage. So let me see what a Big Mac and fries costs here. <laughs> yeah. Um, where the labor costs are obviously lower. Yeah. Uh, so the Big Mac and fries and a drink, the whole meal, like the, whole the, meal. the yeah. value the meal value or whatever, meal. Yeah. Um, is ten twenty nine here. Yeah. Which I still think is kind of high. But it is It is high. <laughs> I, it wasn't that long ago, it seems like, that those things were still like six bucks. Six, seven bucks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it wasn't. I mean, c- during COVID, that was your, I would say that was your average price. Yeah. So um, they, they make this brilliant comment about how capital is trying to screw you. So let, let me go ahead and throw that. Under that, the bus. Uh, yeah. That clip in here oh, okay. actually is what I was yeah. going to say. Okay. I, I'll throw it under the bus. <laughs> After the clip. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> yes, they're always going to try to get as much as they can for as little cost as they can. Exactly. Always. That it is does, never yes. going to stop whether the minimum wage is $20 or whether it's $7. They are always going to do what they can to get the most for themselves and spend the least amount of money they can. And labor, they view as a cost. It is a cost. Is labor a cost to you? <laughs> I believe it is. Unless the government is subsidizing it, yeah. then yeah, it's a cost. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Well, I, you know, this is, he, 
he's actually saying these things in a very critical way. But yes, labor is in fact a business cost. Yeah. Yeah. That's just like, the reality I know he's, of the He's trying to say that they've impersonalized the employees and so forth. But yeah, yeah the guys that are that are the like the bean counters there, yeah. They're just Put there, numbers it's, on a it's page. Number on the numbers on the paper, you and it has to the, add up to black, not red. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, labor is in fact a cost, um, and uh, the the flip side of what he said is also true. So he's complaining about you know all that capitalists want to do is they want to get as as much labor as they can for as little cost as possible. Yeah, that's true. But on the other side of that. The labor is trying to do as little as possible for as much money as they can get. Exactly. I mean, that's you meet just, in the middle somewhere. That's the nature of business, right yeah. there. Both sides have negotiating power. Yeah. Here's the problem: is that especially in states like California, where they have put so many restrictions and requirements on businesses that it drives up all of their costs. Yeah. It has eliminated jobs to the point where there are more there are more employees than there are jobs. Yeah. And so therefore <laughs> the employees are competing with each other for jobs and the capital wins. Yeah. The capital has the leverage. Yep. Whereas if you removed a lot of those requirements, you would probably find that there were a lot more jobs available and that therefore employees would have more negotiating power. Yeah. Well, and, and, and to that point, like those jobs may would pay less, but all of, to me at least when when you want to talk about a job is that's a that's an opportunity and so yeah you may start out at a lower pay but it's just the door being open for you mm-hmm. like you make of it what you will you know and if you if you work for a company for a year and you're not getting anywhere go find another company to work for because if you're a good employee you'll make your way yeah um and but not everybody's a good employee so mm-hmm. that's that's where you end up. <laughs> they're they're constantly concerned with the worker in their discussion and saying, you know, so they're showing. Uh, well, and by someone, the way, so am I. Like, well, yeah. I mean, that's that's a huge important thing, but you have to look at it from both sides. Well, there's a side that they're missing. So yeah. I, I understand their position to be on the side of the worker as opposed to the side of the capital. Yeah, like I get that. That's fair. Like, okay, the worker is more valuable to you than the corporation. Sure, yeah. I get that. But no. there's also another there's another party in this no. that they seem to be continually ignoring or dismissing the cost to them, which is the consumer. Yeah. Right. So obviously, as the cost to produce a product go up, the cost of the product goes up. Yeah. Right. So they're um, they, they respond to somebody had posted uh, a picture of prices at In-N-Out Burger on March 29th and then on April 1st. And yeah. the the big burger, the double double. Yeah. Have you ever been to In and Out? I haven't. No. Okay. I, I've only eaten it in and out once or twice because I don't I don't generally spend any time out west. So I haven't had a lot of opportunity to eat in and out burger. Yeah. And if you're traveling, you tend to not eat fast food also. Yeah. <laughs> or at least I don't, you know, yeah. go to a like a, a real Sit restaurant. Down, yeah. Um but so I have had in and out and it's pretty good um their fries are soggy uh, yeah but the burger is good okay just as a side note <laughs> All right. good to know anyway the the cost of the double double had gone up a quarter in those two days um that's a the, pretty big two-day jump i would say i think so too now they're dismissing it like oh you got to pay another quarter for a burger all right so like what if you go to in and out burger one day a week I mean, that's a dollar a month extra cost for you. That's only $12 a year. Who cares? Yeah. Okay. So, but now what if you're a single mother with three kids? Yeah. Yeah. And you go to In-N-Out Burger once a week and you all only get a burger and nothing else. Yeah. All right. So that's an extra dollar a week, $4 a month, $50 a year might make a difference to you. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but you're in that position Fifty dollars a year in, in food well, costs can make a big and, difference. And especially, to you. I mean, that happened in two days. Mm-hmm. So what's gonna happen a month from now or a year from now? Like these prices right. aren't gonna go the other way. Right. Like they're only going one direction. Mm-hmm. Well, and here's the other thing. They like they th- they actually point out on there that In N Out is such a ridiculous example anyway, because In N Out already pays their employees a bunch. Yeah. So the the 
um, in and out Burger was already paying their employees 19 bucks an hour, so it only jumped up to 20 bucks an hour. Yeah. And they still raised their prices f- from 565 to 590 for a burger or yeah. whatever, right? Yeah. So, yeah, what about the companies that aren't paying, aren't going out of their way to pay their employees more? Yeah. Now, and they do point out um, that, uh, okay, so they, they talk about this study that was done that says that all these companies, they have the money for this. They don't have to raise their prices to make up the difference. Yeah. That they can just eat it, which is kind of... <laughs> to expect the corporation to do that is just to not understand how corporations work at exactly. all. <laughs> and the corporations have a responsibility to their stockholders exactly. to maximize profits. Exactly. Right. They can get in trouble for that on the other side. Yep. So from um, the government. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the same government that's imposing this. Well, actually, yeah. it's not the same government it's, it's, that's imposing yeah, this. It's state government versus, versus federal. Government. Federal, but still though, the yeah. point stands. Yeah. Um, now the study that they refer to said that the these companies just need to stop doing stock buybacks. Yeah. Um that the ten largest fast food corporations uh spent six point one billion dollars um in stock buybacks last year, and that even being very generous about the costs, in in other words, inflating the costs of these wage increases is only going to cost them four point six billion. And so they would still even have, without changing anything, they would still have one and a half billion dollars in stock buybacks this year. Yeah. Now, I get that, but we're. I mean, that's a reasonable point on the surface. I yeah. guess I would even say. Yeah. But we're not comparing apples to apples here, like. That six point one billion dollars that they used in stock buybacks, we're talking about international companies. Yeah, most of these. Yeah, I'm I sure. mean, like the ten biggest fast food restaurants are all. I bet all, but maybe not. But yeah. at least mostly international companies. Yeah. So their profit that they generated across the world resulted in six point one billion dollars in stock buybacks that they did. And their increased labor costs in one state in one country yeah. are going to cost them three quarters of that. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. I mean, so what and, incentive? And I'll tell you, I mean, that's an incentive to jump out of the state. And it is. Like, I mean, that that's, I mean, you can see companies move in that direction. Mm-hmm. Like you minimize their profits in that state. What incentive do they have? Yeah. Why, why should we even bother? And there's plenty of companies that just won't do business in California. <laughs> like that's, that's a thing. Yeah. I, I, that doesn't surprise me. Um, now the, you know, another thing that they were talking about here is that, uh, <laughs> that these companies are constantly increasing their prices anyway. Yeah. That, um, they have an annual price increase of 2.2% since 2014. So, then I was like, okay, well, what has inflation been since 2014? Yeah, exactly. Well, the average annual inflation rate since 2014 is 2.8%. So they're actually charging less than the inflation. Than, their, than yeah, the they're value losing. of the dollar would say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They have already reduced profits, even with their rate increases, their price increases every year. Yeah. And they've probably made up that gap through cutting labor. Probably. I mean, I, as somebody that works for a corporation, like, I mean, I see that stuff all the time. Like, yeah. I mean, any th- time things get tight, that's the first thing to cut. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the easiest thing to cut. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, you cut your neck in the process because the more you cut labor, the worse the product is. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, that's just the nature of things. But but that's a whole lot easier than renegotiating contracts with your vendors. Well, and it, all that well yeah. I mean, you hit a point where that's the only thing you can do mm-hmm. is, is cut the labor, you know. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you should mention that because that leads us into our next clip. Oh, you ready? Cool. I'm ready. They're going to go to automation. They're doing that anyway. Have you walked into McDonald's lately? They, they have the screen there to order it. They were already doing that. Has the, they're going to do that in any case. And multiple studies have shown that higher wages lead to increased worker retention, recruitment, and job growth. The minimum wage in California has gone up every year since 2015. On the same timeline, fast food restaurants in California added 142,000 jobs. Hang on. I thought they're going to fire people if you raise the wage. Every year, the wage has gone up, and they've added 142,000 jobs. 
Okay, it turns out I had to finagle a little bit with that clip because I had some mixed up, but we made it work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, what they've done though, it's a couple of things to respond to the first part of that. Like, yes, they are already moving towards automation. You've just sped it up though. Yeah, and something that you've got to understand with the automation, if it's cheaper for them to pay people than it is for them to automate, mm -hmm. they will always choose to pay the people. Because for one, it's more personable. But for two, there's an upfront investment when you buy that equipment. Right. It, I mean, it and costs, there's ongoing costs with that too. Well, there's always maintenance cost, and mm -hmm. especially because I've used a lot of that equipment, it sucks. To be truthful with you, yeah. Um, and these corporations know that. Like, there's um, they're buying these equipment from companies, and it's just it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. um, there's always kinks to work out and that type of thing. It's easier to pay the people. But when, when you drive the labor up to a certain point, it just makes sense to automate. Like it's, it just, it be, you start looking at the numbers. It's like, dude, why would we ever hire people when we can just have a computer do it? Yeah. You know, and you never have to worry about, um, you know, a, a former employee suing you or showing up angry and yeah. doing damage or anything like that. Oh yeah. I mean, so, once they have been thoroughly replaced by <laughs> computers, <right. Yeah. laughs> maybe initially. Yeah. Um, well, and for the second part of that, that, oh, well, you know, the prices, the wages have gone up year after year anyway, and they've increased jobs. Huh. This is the implication there is that these are somehow related, but correlation is not causation. And I can't imagine if you asked him point blank, if he's trying to make the case that because wages have gone up every year, they have employed more people. Yeah. I'm sure that he would even balk at that. Yeah. So it's not a relevant statistic. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what's happened is the state's grown. Not yeah. that quickly, though, honestly. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they have gained about a million people. Yeah. I mean, you I figure he, he started his um, numbers at, what, 2015? So, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they were growing up until COVID, but you, I know California has shrank since COVID. Yeah, they I, I, they lost a lot of people in COVID. Like, if you if you go from 2015 to 2019 or something like that, yeah. there's much greater population increases than after that. Yeah. Oh, so people I, were getting out of that state. They were evacuating, yeah. Yeah. And Florida experienced the opposite. <laughs> right. And so did Texas. Yeah, yeah, Texas too. It's true. Um, cause that's where all the Californians, that's went. where the California, <laughs> no, there's something to that. Um, so yeah, it, it's obviously not the case that because of the price increases that they have increased the number of people. Now I would say that it's, it's possible that it's gone the other way that it's, well, I don't know. Let's start with the basics. I suppose like what happens when prices go up? Demand goes down. Yeah. Right. So like if you increase the price of something, then the number of people who still want that thing is reduced. Yep. So in time, let's kind of play this out about what happens. So they increase labor costs for fast food restaurants. Um, fast food prices go up. Uh, they reduce the number of jobs. Or, like there's fewer people that are buying that fast food. They're taking other alternatives now because yeah opportunity cost, right? Like this is a consideration. If it now costs me less to do something other than fast food, go to McDonald's. If yeah. it's now cheaper to stop by and pick up a sandwich at Safeway or whatever, I don't know what all grocery yeah. stores they have out there anymore, but, um, you know, maybe that's cheaper than running into uh, McDonald's yeah. and it's just as quick. Yeah. I, like I maybe, do this maybe quicker. Thing. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I, so, um, so then, yeah, demand goes down the number of jobs needed to fill the demand goes down. Yeah. Right. Um, the amount of competition is also going down because remember that first part where, uh, it, it has to be something with greater than 60 locations. Yeah. All right. Now what you have is you, th you think, and he thinks he's giving his buddy at Panera bread a break here too. Yeah. Um, that their labor costs aren't going to go up. Now, if you, th if you think that this isn't a burden, by the way, this is another point to make. If you think that this is not a burden on the employer, why would you make a carve out for your buddy's business? All right. All right. Exactly. So certainly yeah. Newsom recognizes yeah. or at least believes that this is a, this is going to be a burden on employers. Yeah. All right. 
But here's the other side of it. All right, you said, okay, any small companies, we want to give them the chance to compete, so uh, we're not going to impose this burden on them. Yeah. You've created a different kind of burden on them. In a, in a way, you've actually imposed this burden on them too. Because yeah. now, why are you going to work at a small fast food place that will only pay you $16 an hour when you could go to McDonald's and get paid $20 an hour? Yeah. So exactly. all those places are going to either not have labor or have to push their own prices up. Yep. Well, now they don't have the kind of capital sto- uh, stocks that, um, that were stored, guys, I guess you would yeah, say, that the big guys that have, the big guys have to, to handle this. Yep. And you push a bunch of smaller businesses out. Yep. You per- push a bunch of other kinds of competing businesses donut shops or whatever. Who knows? Yeah. Um, bakeries. <laughs> All of a sudden, there's a lot of bakeries in California. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe you push a bunch of them out because they can't get the labor unless they increase their costs. Um, maybe they can't do one of those things, yeah. right? Like, And so you've reduced the competition for these big fast food places. You've gotten rid of the small guys. Now only the big corporations survive. Maybe the demand goes back up for them. I mean, I don't know how this affects regular restaurants. Yeah. Um, it could affect them kind of in the same way. It's hard to say. Yeah. Have to push their costs up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, I, I guess my point there is that you don't know how this is going to trickle down into the rest of the economy. No. Because well, in any scarcity time, is is a thing. Yeah. There's labor scarcity. There's um, resource scarcity. There's a lot of things that are going to be affected by this. Yeah, anytime you start jacking around with the economy, you don't know how things are going to go. Like you can you can kind of run run experiments and thought experiments and that kind of thing, but the reality is is once the the measure has been put into place, you kind of start learning what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, Let's go ahead and enact the spill so we know what it does. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, so and it's like these people haven't studied any of the history of what prior bills have ever done. Mm-hmm. It's or like price fixing, oh which God. is what this is. Which is what this is. Yeah. This is absolutely it's, it's price fixing, fixing a labor price. Absolutely. Um, I'll give you something uh, concrete, actually, too, that has been discussed about this. Um, so public school food workers, like cafeteria workers in in schools. Yeah. This doesn't affect their wages. Really. Yes. I guess they got those good government jobs. They're already making, what, 30 bucks an hour, right? Probably not. <laughs> you don't think so? Probably not. Yeah. Um, because the discussion is, well, now the state's going to have to increase their wages yeah. to 20 bucks an hour to keep them from leaving the school cafeteria and going working at McDonald's. No, yeah, that's mm-hmm. probably true. Um, and California is one of the states that already offers free lunches to all students. Oh, really? Yes. Well, that's nice of them. I agree even in Beverly Hills, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so they'll have to pay their uh, their public school food workers more money to keep the labor there. Yeah. Which, of course, increased the costs for everybody in the state. That yeah. increases the state's budget mm-hmm. now. Um, and you can say, well, they'll be paying more in taxes like Jen Briney might have years ago. Hopefully she's learned. Yeah. Um, I hate to pick on her. I actually really like her, but... Yeah. Anyway, um, no, but these are jobs that are being paid out of the tax fund. Yeah, exactly. Right? So them paying more taxes doesn't actually lower the tax burden. It's it's yeah. still, you know. Anyway, um, so that costs everybody in the state because there's only a few things that, there's only two things that a state can do about that problem. They yeah. can only increase taxes yeah. or borrow the money. Yeah, which I'm pretty sure California's capped out in both those departments. They might be. They're certainly... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, they're not doing well. I know that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is just one little thing, like uh, the increasing the, the cost of or the labor cost for one business draws employees into that business, reduces the number of employees needed for that business, and forces all the other businesses to make up the difference, too, in order to keep their labor. Yeah. Like, it, it's yeah. just... Uh, and and it's it really is... It's crazy because then you you couple that with uh, fast food is a dying industry. Like this, this is an industry that is not long for this world. Um, I mean, there's always going to be fast food, but in the next ten years, just watch. Like mm-hmm. these companies are going to start folding. So a lot of them are. There's yeah. there, we. I, my guess would be in the next ten years, we'll probably have half as many fast food places as what we have now. Yeah, COVID just about broke it. Yeah. I um. 
the the idea would have been that COVID would have been improved the the stakes for fast food. Yeah. Uh, but the ingredients the other, were there to do it, but it didn't well, play he, out that the, way. The problem was that all the other restaurants had to figure out a way to make money during COVID when they couldn't sit people in the restaurant. Yeah. So they started offering all kinds of takeout programs. Yeah. Um, and the truth is, is it, delivery and carry out actually. Yeah. And so now I'm in a position here, uh, cause I, I look at it all the time. I'm in a position here where it costs me roughly the same. Yeah to go get a burger at a fast food place yeah. as it is to order and pick up a burger from a steakhouse. Yeah. Yeah. And one of those has a lot higher quality than the other. Yeah. <laughs> just saying, unless you're just in the mood for a fast food burger. Yeah. Um, I, I learned that lesson every few years for a while. I have finally <laughs> learned it permanently for my life. Yeah. You're done. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it used to be every couple of years I would, be like, why don't I eat at McDonald's? And I would stop by McDonald's. I'm going to pick on McDonald's specifically here. I don't have enough money to sue. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a this is a personal opinion only. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is one man's opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't I don't process McDonald's burgers well. Apparently, I don't think anybody processes McDonald's <laughs> burgers well. <laughs> so I, every few years, I would have forgotten though. Yeah. And I would think, man, why don't I go to McDonald's? This been a while. Why don't I, why haven't I been at McDonald's in so long? And I'd order a burger and I'd eat that burger and I'd say, man, that burger is so good. It was good, right? Why don't yeah. I order McDonald's so anymore? Till an hour later. Yeah, like about 45 <laughs> minutes later, I'd be like, oh yeah. Yep, yep. I yep. remember now. Yep. It's all coming back to but now me. it's permanent. <laughs> it's in there. Never, never going to McDonald's again. Oh, I, I, I finally learned it permanently like 10 years ago or so. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, yep, done. Um, oh. But yeah, we're in a position now where you can get a higher quality meal of roughly the same thing yeah, for roughly the same price. Yeah. Right. Why would you go to the and other? And it's just as convenient. Yeah. Or very nearly. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I uh, mean, California is really just attacking an industry that's, that's mm -hmm. not long for this world as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And you know, back to the, his point about the, um, the uh, factory workers, like, well, the factory jobs moved away. Yeah. Fast food can't move away, exactly. <laughs> no, it just goes away. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's that's what happens. And like I say, regardless of what California does, I think that, that the the story's already written there. Mm -hmm. So we'll, time will tell, but... So uh, along the same lines of California's um, financial problems... We are not going to hit everything that we wanted to hit today. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, it take a long time to talk about minimum wage. I know. We had a... Um, minimum wage is a tough one because this is one I, I always get in arguments with people about because, mm -hmm. because like it affect, feel, people feel like it affects them so directly. Yeah. Like that's, that's, my, like that's my wage, you know. You mm -hmm. know? And it's, they, you just got to understand the economics behind it. Yeah, that was one of the few things that um, that Gary Johnson actually handled really well every time it came up. Yeah, when he was running for president in 2016. Yeah. Um, well, okay. If uh, higher wages for uh, to start are better, then why don't we just put it up to 75? Yeah, a hundred. Because <laughs> if if uh, if 15 is better than 10, why isn't 75 better than 15? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's when people start to well, I mean. Well, then you have a problem. We can't do that with like. <laughs> uh, with the cost of all these. Yeah, exactly. It, this it's is a part problem. of cost of goods sold. Yeah. I mean, at my business, yeah. employees and contractors are part of cost of goods sold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's literally classified that way. That, cost of goods sold. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyway, so uh, you mentioned this to me. I don't know how much you put into it, but um. I looked into the San Francisco grocery store stuff. Oh, did stuff. you? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, it's related, so I, I did yeah. kind of want to bring it up. So San Francisco uh, revived some legislation from the 80s that prohibited grocery stores from closing without giving the city six months notice. Yeah. And um, they, if they're going to close, they have to work with the community to find a new owner or create some kind of grocery co-op to make sure that the groceries are still available to that community. Yeah. 
<laughs> this is this is this, legislation. This yeah, is a yeah. city requirement. Now it's not through yet. They actually passed it through the city council back in the eighties. And yeah. Diane Feinstein of all of people, all people <laughs> yes. said that it was an unnecessary intrusion into the market. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I left that out the other day when we were talking, but yeah, I, I did hear that. That's insane. Of yeah. all the people, right? Yeah. So this is now the the problem is that with their own policies, they've driven businesses out. Yeah. Um, well, that's and that's really the crux of the reason I thought we should talk about it is because mm-hmm. it's not like these businesses have just up and decided to leave these areas. Yeah. Like the the legislative policies as far as shoplifting and mm-hmm. and just controlling crime and homelessness in the area. Yeah, and the benefits they're required to give to employees and the pay that they're supposed to yeah. give to employees and uh, it's, it's all one the, of these situations uh, bureaucracy that they have to go through and the city taxes and. Yeah. St- Everything, everything. It's everything. one of these situations where they're they're basically putting these businesses in a situation as well. I just don't want to do business here, and so this is a policy that's like, well, now you don't have a choice. Well, grocery stores is a really interesting um, industry to to talk about in this way because grocery stores have like notoriously low percentage take if you're thinking of it from a gambling perspective, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, their profit margins are tiny. Yep. Oh, tiny. I know. Yeah. Like just a couple of percent. Yeah. So they're, they're and, and grocery a, stores. A lot are, of it is lost leaders. Like there's a lot of stuff they're selling. They're losing money on. Yeah. Um, grocery stores are already like riding the edge Yeah. Uh, of, of losing money, like being in the red and having to sh- close shop. Yeah. Just to start. Um, and so then you, you place a, a bunch of legislative, like bureaucratic requirements on them. Um, you require them to pay for all kinds of employees, uh, benefits that they don't necessarily want to include. Yeah. Um, they have to include these things in their costs, which, you know, increases their prices, which makes people want to go to fast food instead until now. <laughs> um, <laughs> till we destroy the, that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, uh, and then of course there's, San Francisco, um, and uh, there's a few other like far left wing states that have this problem. Their policies about theft. Yeah. Uh, yeah, since that's, they have no respect one. for yeah. private property in these kind of places. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, people can go in and steal and there's no, no repercussions. Yeah. And no recourse for the business itself. Yeah. You have forced them into a position where they cannot possibly be profitable. Yeah. And so they leave and then you set down legislation to prevent them from leaving. And yeah. actually on that note, like back to the factory thing. Yeah. Um, I saw somebody in the comments on this saying, well, of course this is why all those factory factories left. Yeah. And somebody else responded, well, you just need to pass legislation that prevents them from moving out. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what's, California is one step ahead of you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but this is such a ridiculous thing. Like this is fascism at its very core. Yes, it is. <laughs> Without question. Like to tell a business that they can't move their business somewhere well, else. You can't leave. <laughs> yeah. We're going to build a wall. We're going to build a wall and the barbed wire is going to face in. Exactly. <laughs> I, so when I was in high school. I went to a boarding school and I I remember at a student council meeting where there was, we had some complaints, (laughs) the students and, um, there, something came up about the fence around the school and the barbed wire. Yeah. And they were like, well, we're in a bad neighborhood, which was true. Yeah. We're in a bad neighborhood and that's there for your protection. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, a buddy of mine who I, I'd gone to high school with before we both went to the magnet school yeah. um, was, uh, he might have been the, stu- the uh, our class president. I can't remember. But he was, anyway, he was on the student council. Yeah. And he said, okay, but then why is the barbed wire facing in? Yeah, right. <laughs> but they didn't have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they did not. <laughs> um, same situation here, I right. think. Yeah. <laughs> This, that's when the barbed wire is facing in. Yeah. Yep. We're no longer trying to keep the immigrants out. We're trying, <laughs> trying to keep to the keep businesses. It, keep in. you in. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so, yeah. And then beyond that, they have uh, created a situation where businesses are less likely to open. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're definitely. Yeah. If we're having to wall them in, I'm not trying to get in on that market. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
or if I have to, uh, if I have to run at a loss. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I can't do this. Like this right. is not business. I so I got um, one of my friends at the office. He's constantly complaining. He's like, I don't have a better solution, but profit is a terrible thing. Okay. Profit is an evil thing. Profit draws people to do the most awful things. And he'll talk about like pharma, <laughs> pharmaceutical <laughs> companies and stuff like that, which I, which I don't it's know, hard, I, to, hard to argue with, honestly. But yeah. I, I say, but the other side of that, though, is that profit is what incentivizes people to do good things for people that they don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's the essence <laughs> of the free market. Like, yes. You know, I mean, that's... Profit motive is important to get p- people to do things for people that they don't know and yeah. don't care about. Yeah. Or maybe even necessarily like. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, the drive for profit has eliminated racism in a lot of places, actually. <laughs> I believe it. Like, I mean, <laughs> I, it, that's like true. You know, so. like uh, like what Dave Smith is always saying, you know, I'm I'm a Jew in New York. I can go stand out on the corner and raise my hand and a Muslim will pick me up and take me anywhere in the city that I want to go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's that's if that ain't the free market, like I don't and know. Say, man. I'll, I'll be with you when I hand him my money when I get out. <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. Um, so, yeah, they they are, but they, they've revived this legislation because they're having trouble keeping businesses there, and they're yeah. creating through their own policies what they're calling food deserts, where people can't access fresh food. Yeah. And then they're just trying to take over. And it, it, we're not, the next step is, of course, that the city will actually take over. Yeah, we'll start actually running the grocery stores. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, honestly, they're not far from it. Like, no. And then, then everybody can pay for it. Yeah. And, not, and then they'll have the police patrol and they'll make sure they oh, don't yeah. get shoplifted. That might be true. That's <laughs> finally get some uh, protection there for the grocery stores when the state runs. Them. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Whole um, other story when it's the state. <laughs> so now for something completely different. Go. Um, oh, so Trump has a new pos- or I don't know that it's necessarily a new position, but he put out a big statement this last week about abortion and kind of where he stands and where his campaign stands and whatnot. And, and I don't know, I think it's pretty good. Um, I mean, basically he said what I've been saying is that the Supreme court has thrown this down to the States and it's the, up to the States to decide what each state wants to do. Um, and he put out a position that like his position is, you know, he wants exemptions for, um, I just had them. Sorry. It was, it was like rape, incest, uh, danger to the mother. Yeah, yeah, because it was like three. Yeah, go so. ahead and pull it up to make sure that there's nothing missing, because if there's well, nothing missing, the, I the, have some comments. The thing I clipped was, was yeah, <clears throat> rape, incest, and life of the mother. Mm-hmm. Um, I swear he put out a, one that was longer than that, but yeah. I couldn't find it. Okay. Um, but that's not the, so don't, <clears throat> I mean, that that's what he said in that post, but mm-hmm. I swear he put out one where he had a couple of more exemptions. Okay. Well, um, I think the, I think the state level policy is better than a federal policy. I do too. Um, I've said that from the beginning. I, I just, um, I feel like the Supreme Court made the right decision. Like mm-hmm. this should be a state's issue. Yeah, this isn't something that's addressed in the Constitution, and therefore should be a state's issue. Yeah, uh, it is certainly. Um, if you fall on the other side of whatever decision is in your state you can move much more easily from state to state than you can out of the country. Absolutely. All right. Um, and uh, presumably, this is certainly obvious, not always the case, but presumably, or the I- ideal, ideally, your state's position should re- reflect the populist position within the state. Yeah. And I think over time it will. Like, yeah. there's a lot of that being hashed out right now, and yeah. there's there's some really bad laws out there right now mm-hmm. in some states. Um, and I think that in the next, uh, and it sucks for those states right now. Like, I'm not trying to downplay that because it is bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I do think that time will hash this out. Yeah, I, I certainly hope so. Um, now I want to I want to be clear on my position here. Yeah. I. Okay, let me start again with the basics. All right. All right. I don't think any of us can dispute that life begins somewhere between conception and birth. (laughs) You think so? (laughs) Yeah. Now, any, I know I've talked about this on the podcast before, but for any new listeners, all right. Life begins somewhere between conception and birth. Okay. 
Um, I don't know when that is. And any position that you choose between those two points, conception and birth, is necessarily arbitrary. Yeah. All right. Um, that neither one of those options is popular. Yeah. Like, well, although that's the talking point on the right, or at least no, that's the left's talking point about the right, that they want to eliminate abortions entirely. So calling it a life at conception. Yeah. That's That's not really the majority. Not really where these guys. Yeah. That's a, a, yeah, that's a small minority of people that believe that. Yeah. There are some, but you're right. It's a minority for sure. The right's talking point about the left is that they want abortions right up until birth. Sometimes or, or after. Sometimes after. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, again, that is not the popular position. No. <laughs> on the left. Yeah. Um, that is a small minority that's yeah. pushing for that kind of legislation. So, and mostly I think that people would just recognize the nuance and the, the value in the other side's position. Like, the people on the right are not trying to control women's bodies and the people on the left are not wanting to kill babies. Yeah. Like those things are not true either. (laughs) I mean, there probably are for a few people, but that's again, a very small percentage of people. Yeah. Um, people on the right are for the most part are wanting to protect life and people on the left for the most part are wanting to protect the choices of people in these positions. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. And I, I think that both of those positions are perfectly valid. Yeah. I, I understand the morality on both sides of that. Yeah. Now, for me, I don't know where life begins exactly. Yeah. And so I'm not comfortable putting a point in there. If somebody were to come to me who was considering an abortion, yeah. I would urge them to choose anything else. Yeah. In the end, though, I believe that that decision is between that person and their doctor yeah, and no one else. I, I mean, I do agree. Like I say, I mean, I, I think that having states and areas make the decision for those areas mm-hmm. is, is the right thing politically to do. I, I think, I think it's a step in the right direction. Maybe this yeah. is where you and I diverge. Maybe. Um, I think it's a step in the right direction to move it from the federal level to the state's level. Yeah. For me, the proper position is politically pro-choice. While I am yeah. personally pro-life, yeah. politically I'm pro-choice because I'm not comfortable defining when life begins, and I'm sure as hell not comfortable with a bunch of attorneys in state legislatures or federal legislatures yeah. determining, defining when life begins. Yeah. Right? I'm, I mean, I, I 100% agree with you on that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I am... I mean, I, I consider myself to be pro-life. Um, I mean, that's kind of where I believe personally. Mm-hmm. Um, like I say, politically, though, it's a little more dicey than that because I am where you are as far as, mm-hmm. like, I don't want the government making these decisions. I, yeah. I think it's between the doctor and the patient. Yeah. Like, this I mean, is that's, not a political decision. It's a medical decision. It is. Mm-hmm. And with all medical decisions, I just don't think the government should be involved in it. Right. Um. Um, so I don't want any kind of legislative guidelines on this. Yeah. I, I so like I said, politically, my position is completely pro-choice. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that professional organizations will step in in some places. I think the American Medical Association, et cetera, maybe the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm, yeah. Like I, I think that I think that professional organizations in the medical field could step in and make some guidelines. Yeah. Um, can threaten licenses and so forth. Yeah. And still kind of have a problem with that. Yeah, I don't know how that will go. I, see, I wouldn't have a problem with that if if the license wasn't necessary to practice. There you go. Yeah, right? That's so the, I, I have problems with professional licenses to begin with, but I'm yeah. perfectly content with professional organizations that kind of oversee their field yeah. and put opinions out there. Yeah. I just don't think that if I the mean, that's American what you Medical would, Association pulls somebody that's licensed that they shouldn't be able to practice anymore. Yeah, it, they should just be on know that that person should have to say, Hey, look, I'm not sanctioned yeah. by this organization. Yeah. You I know? mean, but people don't pick their doctors by going through roles on the American medical association. Anyway, you pick your yeah. doctors based generally on references I, from other people. 
That's that's probably largely true. I bet there is some people that would shy away from somebody that they knew had been barred from an sure. association like that. Yeah, in the same way that you probably are less likely to pick an attorney that was disbarred than, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> than an attorney that's still sanctioned by the bar association. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. But you might not. You yeah. might think, well, hey, this guy is exactly who I need. Yeah, uh, no. Um, so I as agree. long as they're still able to practice, I don't. Don't have a no. I'm yeah, with you. I'm like I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> We're getting off on it. This is going to be a long podcast. Yeah. Um, because yeah, we get we got yeah. one more little topic after <laughs> this too, and this could be a long one. Um, yeah. and and I do want to address this as fully as we can because I I do think this well, is important. It's it's a big issue. Um, and th- that's why it's a political issue though. It's an yeah. emotional issue. It's a it's a way to get people worked up and out there voting. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and the Democrats don't have a lot going for them right now. But yeah, this, this one, is something they're leaning on. But this on is now. a winner for them. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's been it's done been proven through, what, one? At least one election. Yeah. Well, maybe. I mean, we don't yeah. know that that's why. Yeah, but the a lot of the numbers definitely say that, like I say. Okay. I, I haven't mean, seen statistics it's, on... It's hard to say like, for sure. Issue but, voting there. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it definitely, it was a factor in the last midterm. Okay. So I think that they like, this is why I have a problem with any kind of legislation about this. So even Trump's thing. All right. Uh, rape, incest, danger to the mother. Yeah. I don't think that's enough. That yeah. just doesn't cover all the possibilities that may not necess- not necessitate an abortion, but incentivize an abortion and be a position that I completely understand. Yeah. So take, for example, um, uh, Kate Cox, I think was her name. Um, this is the, the lady that Biden referred to in a state of the union who had to go get an abortion. She was a Texas resident. She had to go get an abortion in another state because Texas wouldn't allow her. Yeah. Um, that she, she had to petition the court for permission for an abortion, and they determined that there was no danger to her health, yeah. and so they denied it. Now, the idea of a yeah. woman having to petition the court <laughs> for a medical the, procedure, yeah, yeah, I got a problem with that. Right, all right, so it's already a problem there. Yeah. Now, I don't know where she went. Like, I kept, every time I brought this up before, uh, at least until this week, I kept saying, well, so she like, whatever, she went to Arizona to get an abortion. Well, now Arizona has this like Same really law. draconian yeah. abortion law that they've enacted. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I guess not as Arizona anymore. That yeah. might've been at the time. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. But uh, New Mexico yeah, think, maybe or something. Yeah. Um, and this is by the way, the Arizona thing is one where I don't think that their abortion law is in line with the population. Yeah. But that's the reason I'm saying like like time's going to hash this out because that that one was um I guess ruled by the Supreme Court based off a of previous before Roe v. Wade, right? Yeah, they had a law on the books from the 1860s or something. Yeah, that that, that they had never yeah, I yeah, that got put back into place once Roe v. Wade had been overturned, mm-hmm. more or less. Yeah, I I think yeah. that that's correct. I hadn't really looked into how that this was came my, to that be. Was my that was my understanding too. Yeah. Um, so hopefully we're right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if not, Michael at the Liberty Mike.com <laughs> will correct it later. Yeah. Um, so this woman, she, her, so her baby had, or her fetus, um, had been diagnosed with trisomy 18. Have you heard of trisomy 18? Not okay. specifically. Yeah. Trisomy 18 is a genetic defect where, um, you have a third copy of the 18th chromosome. Okay. Um, I guess it's like like Down syndrome is a third copy of a chromosome as well. So, the, yeah. you know, this is Same. another kind of thing. Yeah. But um, in the case of trisomy 18, uh, many of the fetuses don't survive to birth. Something like... Um, Oh, I can't remember the percentage now. I definitely should have. I wrote down all these percentages and I didn't write down <laughs> you that You missed one. that one, yeah. Um, but I, I, I want to say that it was like between 90 and 95% don't, of the fetuses don't make it to term. Yeah. And then something like 40% of the fetuses that make it to term are lost during labor. Yeah. Um, and then uh, fewer than one in 10, if they survive the labor, make it 
through the first year. Yeah. And so like you add all this together and it's something like it's less than a 1% chance from conception that the child will last through the first year. Yeah. All right. Like it's a tiny percentage yeah. and, but it's not dangerous to the mother directly. Yeah. I mean, it's just going through a pregnancy. That's going to be a waste. Right. I mean, I, I hate to put it that way, but I mean, it, it is, especially when you're that's talking about, to be a waste. yeah. And especially when you're talking about somebody that's wanting to be a parent and like, that's, that's time you're not going to get back. Right. To try again. And, Pregnancy is really rough on a woman's body. Oh, it absolutely is. <laughs> Regardless of what my wife will tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, most women that I have talked to have expressed that this is very difficult. Yeah. Um, so, like, the idea of because there's not a direct danger to her life. Now, there are still things that can go wrong that can threaten her life yeah. during the course of this pregnancy. But because yeah. the condition itself is not a direct threat to her life the state said that it didn't fall under the danger to the mother carve out that they have. Yeah. And so they denied the abortion. Yeah. I which, disagree. Which is, which is I mean, wild. I because, understand that point. Yeah. Like in the letter of the law, they're right. Yeah. But you're forcing a woman to carry a baby that is, has a very tiny, tiny chance of surviving. Yeah. Why would you force her to do that? Yeah, it should be up to the mother. It mm-hmm. goes back to what you're saying. It should be up to the, the patient and the doctor. And if I'm not for having these type of tribunals or courts or whatever mm-hmm. that make these type of decisions, yeah. but even if you were going to, it seems like that should all be ran through doctors. Yeah. And like, let me let me just add, just so that people understand a little better, this genetic defect, like some of the possibilities here. Yeah. Um, if the child survives... Uh, first off, they, they often have a very low birth weight. Um, they are, heart defects are common. Um, if they survive, uh, they have generally have a severe intellectual disability. Um, there are other organ malformations that can be a problem, particularly like kidneys and stuff. Um, like even if they make it, so here's. The response in the response to the State of the Union, some uh, Florida politician, I think it was Rick Santorum, really, that guy, yeah, um, said that he and his wife had a child with trisomy eighteen, and they kept it, and she had just turned sixteen or something like that. Oh wow! I was like, that's an effing miracle, though. Yeah. Like because yours worked out. Now I'm glad that. I'm glad that it did. And they're like, and we're very happy with our daughter. We're so, we can't imagine our lives without her. And, but this woman chose to get rid of hers. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, you, it was dumb luck that yours survived. There was such a small chance of that. And yeah. I'm glad that it worked out for you, but you can't impose your ideas on this woman just because it worked out for you. Yeah. No, I agree. That's like uh, saying that, you know, that's like playing Russian roulette with somebody. Yeah. Right. And you pull the trigger and nothing happens and you hand the gun to them. And he's like, no way. Uh And you're like, no, you have to look how well it worked out for me. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) No, that's ridiculous. So I I don't think that you can create enough carve outs to cover all the possibilities of things that I think that are reasonable for people to get an abortion for. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to have any legislation out there that puts doctors and mothers in a position where they're having to to make choices with the threat of some kind of legal sanctions. Yeah. I mean, like I say, I don't disagree. Um, I don't think that abortion should be used as a form of birth control. Like there's other (laughs) options, like people think ahead. Yeah. But, and, and like I said, I would always encourage somebody to make other choices. Um, like a lot of people want kids that can't have them. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I don't think that there should be legislation preventing it. Yeah. Just because you can't cover, you just can't cover all the possibilities. Yeah. And it's a medical decision, not a political one. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's my thing. Like it, it in the perfect world that there it wouldn't be, wouldn't be a consideration as far as politically government just wouldn't have a say in it at all. Um, Historically, abortions have been tolerated. Yeah. They haven't been endorsed almost anywhere. Yeah. Maybe anywhere. I can't say for sure, though. But they've been... To- what is he doing? 
That was strange. I got yeah, I got a cat reaching for nothing. <laughs> the uh, sky. Just having a <laughs> Throw your hands up. I don't know what that was about. Um, that was weird. So that you know, but um, but abortions have been tolerated. Yeah. Like really everywhere. Yeah. Um, there has been some um, social ostracism. Yeah. Related to mostly the people that were performing the abortions. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but it's been tolerated. It's been accepted as something that is going to well, happen. And and in a in in a more libertarian society, that's what would really you would end up with. Yeah, is, probably. Like in the South, you wouldn't you'd probably still have some, but I guarantee you the rates of abortions in the South versus like up north are probably drastically different pre Roe v. Wade. I don't know that. I don't know that either. I, um, I'm not sure that that's true. I'm not sure it is either. It, I would think it is, though, just because it is such more of a taboo down here. Well, I think that, yeah, it's. But, but it would uh, be scandalous and it would probably be better concealed down here. Yeah. I think it's. I, I don't know that there's really any difference in the rates. I bet yeah. it's just better concealed or more that, frequently concealed. That may be true. Yeah. Um, I mean, it definitely seems like it's more taboo down here than it would be, yeah. you know, there. But A lot of Baptists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of Baptists. Oh, yeah. Um, Those are my people. Watch your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so what are they going to do? <laughs> Baptize you. Turn the other cheek. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so I, I got one more, like... I'm not. I'm not going to linger on this last topic. I just. All I right. got one more clip that I want to comment on before we close up. All right. Save the foreign policy to the very end, and I'm only <laughs> going to talk about it for like a minute. But here we go with Anthony Blinken. Oh, here we go. Ukraine will become a member uh, of NATO. Uh, our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership. Okay. So what has Anthony Blinken done with this statement that assuring that Ukraine will become a part of NATO? Yeah. He has ensured that the Ukraine war will continue. That's oh, yeah. all he has done with this. Yeah, he because- has ensured that the Ukraine war will continue and he has incentivized Russia to utterly destroy the nation of Ukraine. Yeah. Which they are capable of doing. Yes. Like, I mean, I think if anything, time has shown that. Yeah. Well, there's there's no coming back for Ukraine at this point. Yeah. Um, they really should just cut their losses, give up, you know, forty percent of their territory, and be done with it. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't see another way. Yeah. There's there's no way they can win. It doesn't matter how many weapons we give them. Yeah. And if we get involved, that's just worse for everybody. Yeah. And. Um, and France is actually talking about getting involved. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, what's the deal with that? So um, I did see some stuff. It seems like as, as we're kind of tapering back, they're gearing up. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know is that I totally something understand something to do it. with Macron and his, like, political, like, Future? woes? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that, from what um, I can tell, that's what I, I, I see. But like I say, I don't follow it as I haven't as really do. dug into it. I, I would like to. Um, I, I'm trying to satisfy our audience here who was getting tired of Ukraine talk. So <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. Um, so I haven't looked into it as deeply as I'd like. But I, yeah, I think it has more to do with Macron's political future than anything to do with Ukraine, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's... It's a terrible idea. Yeah. Now, the upside is, unless Russia actually attacks France itself or some other NATO country itself, yeah. there is no obligation to any other NATO country. If yeah. France gets a bunch of its people killed in Ukraine, if Russia attacks Frenchmen in Ukraine, it's just no problem. Yeah. yeah. There, there's no, yeah, there's no NATO requirement to get involved at that point. Yeah. Um. But at the same time, then obviously Russia is incentivized to attack French targets that are producing for the war. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, so, it's an escalation. Absolutely. Um, we'll see what they actually do. I'm like, I'm hoping I'm it's skeptical. just a lot more tough talk. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, the French aren't known for... No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> My family's French. I really shouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, the mostly I wanted to talk about Blinken getting up there and just creating a... a essentially telling Russia that they were right to do this in the first place yeah. because this is the what they absolutely wanted to avoid at all costs and kept saying over and over again is that Ukraine cannot join NATO. We will be forced to react in some way. We will do everything in our power to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO. We can't allow our neighbor in the worst part, like in the path of invasion to our country, <laughs> yeah. to become a member of an antagonistic military alliance. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, that, and and here and, we are. And we just don't understand that. No. Uh, at least our political leaders don't understand that. Or they do and don't care. I'm interested to see... I, I've already spent more time on this than I intended to. But I'm, I'm interested to see that when Ukraine loses, because they will, Yeah. Um, when Ukraine loses, what will happen to NATO? Yeah. How does um, NATO respond? Yeah, uh, like, because essentially it's a huge defeat for NATO, even though Ukraine wasn't a NATO, isn't a NATO country. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a huge defeat for us because we've invested so much money into this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens anyway, because I mean, it, there is a good chance that we're looking at four more years of Trump through that. Might be at least Trump spoke out against NATO, but uh, he, you know, he's the one that started arming Ukraine, so... Yeah, I mean, Trump's a wild card. You don't know what he's yeah, going to do. exactly. Um, um, but he, he has he'll, been... But he's he'll been... negotiate an end to the war on day one. That's, <laughs> yeah. He, we'll we'll yeah, see whatever. about that. But, I don't know. I, that's yeah. what he's... That's at least, he's, at least he seems to be opposed to this war, even though he's a big part of why it started. Why it's going on, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So. The other one... Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll see. This this is not a good uh, presidential election for foreign policy. There's no. not there's, there's not a good there's option. no good candidate. Yeah. Like there's I mean other than whoever the libertarians end up putting up yeah is gonna be it. Like probably I don't um, know. Green Party candidate will probably be anti war too. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, yeah, we'll, but, we'll see. But it, you know, as far as like major candidates, like I say, especially in the duopoly, mm -hmm. like there's not like neither side is gonna be any good. Yeah. Well, I, I was talking with uh, another friend at work um, earlier this week. He came over and asked me a political question. He was like, I don't understand this. Tell me about this. But we we started talking about the um, the incentive for voting seems to be stronger through fear. Uh, this is something we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, we've before, talked right? about plenty. Yeah. But um, that putting up bad candidates is more effective at getting people out to vote yeah. than putting up good candidates. And because the, the fear of the other guy winning seems to get people out there more effectively, which would yeah. make you think that actually like one of the major parties would want to put a good candidate up there so as not to incentivize the other party to go out and vote for their candidate just to prevent your candidate from getting in. Yeah. But it just doesn't seem to play out that way. <laughs> well, but the truth is that there's the two parties. They're not really they, it doesn't matter to them which one of those party leaders is president yeah. because they're essentially the same and they just want to maintain that stranglehold on the duopoly. Yeah. They want to maintain that duopoly. They want to maintain that it's only Republicans or Democrats. And in this way, they prevent people from voting for a third party because people won't go out and vote for a third party yeah. if they're worried that the guy that they really hate will get into office because they voted for a third party instead of the guy they only kind of hate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's in, uh, it's incredible. Yeah. Oh, the the people that put it together knew what they were doing. I guess so. I mean, <laughs> divide and conquer. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So let's wrap up there before this on, gets really out of control because it's already happy like note. yeah we're already like an hour and a half into this podcast. Oh so. wow. Um. Yeah. Well, once I went with the clips with and clips, everything. Yeah. yeah. Um. All right. So we expect to be back here next week. Uh. It will definitely be Friday that next week because I've okay. got something that I've got to do on Thursday. All right. Um, so as far as I it know, won't be Thursday be right. or Friday next week. It'll be Friday. <laughs> yeah. All right. And, uh, and I, I verified that last night because I started to worry actually that it might've been yesterday, Thursday that I had the obligation, but it, I, I had it right in my head. It's next Thursday. 
All right. Um, so, but we expect to be back here next week. Um, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, uh, like, and share, comment, subscribe. Um, you can always email me, Michael at the Liberty Mike.com. We appreciate reviews as well. Uh, I guess that, I think that's all the things. That's all um, the things. So uh, we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.